thanks to everybody for coming to the 2024 uh, James P. Jones Distinguished Lecture in American History. This afternoon, we are fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Tara Dudley of the University of Texas. Uh, Dr. Dudley is an assistant professor in the School of Architecture, but she has a much more varied career than that. Uh, she is a nationally celebrated expert on uh, American architecture, particularly vernacular architecture and African-American architecture. Her book, Building Antebellum New Orleans, Free People of Color and Their Influence, uh, is a multi-award winning volume, uh, but it includes the Association of American Publishers Prose Award in Architecture and Urban Planning. She is also a leader in the field of historic preservation with literally decades of experience as a uh, an innovator in that field, doing major projects all over the United States. And this afternoon, Dr. Dudley is going to speak on her recent work uh, for about an hour and then take questions. We're going to ask folks in the room to raise their hands and book to uh, make it accessible for our Zoom folks. You're going to have your question repeated by one of us, and then Dr. Dudley will answer it. We will also be taking questions from the chat. So if you were on the Zoom and have a question, please hold that question to the end and then place it in the chat. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tara Dudley. Good afternoon or almost evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's been exciting to be here at FSU to visit and speak with you all today. And I'd like to thank Dr. Mooney and Dr. Conti as well as everyone in the department for the invitation. And I've just been delighted to be here and speak to students and have a wonderful day. Thank you to everyone on Zoom who has um, tuned in and I'll get started without further ado. So we have time for questions and conversation at the end of the talk. So at the core of architectural history education are the questions, what is architecture and what is an architect? Precisely at the time when the professionalization of American architecture was developing, the work of skilled enslaved men, as well as others, not afforded the title, title builder or architect, was valued financially, but with little to no significance placed on their roles. As such, their identities and specific contributions are largely unignored in the canon of architectural history and the annals of American history. In my talk today, I'd like to offer a framework for identifying unnamed and understudied contributors to American building culture before and after emancipation by examining the enslaved men and freedmen, or a handful of them in any case, who I have encountered in my research on free people of color in New Orleans, as well as enslaved persons and freedmen in Louisiana and Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. The clicker is not clicking. That's cool. Sorry, guys, it wouldn't be a Zoom lecture without a technical. Okay, if you just hit the. So here I have depicted stills from the first episode of season two of the WGN series Underground, which opened with an unnamed enslaved man on a Louisville, Kentucky plantation rising before sunrise. He walks an unknown distance to another plantation construction site where he selects large blocks of stones to meticulously and proudly measure out and carve Corinthian columns and lettered tablets for a Greek revival mansion. Upon completion of his work, the enslaved stonemason is paid in cash for his labor and returns to his home plantation at dusk. He counts the money he was given while waiting patiently outside the main house only for, to present all of the funds to his enslaver. The well-dressed plantation owner snatches his earnings, retreating to his well-appointed home, dismissing the stonemason without a word. This fictional character and storyline are representative of similar scenarios that played out in antebellum America. Across the country, the labor of enslaved men skilled in the building trades was exploited by slave-owning architects, contractors, and craftsmen or were hired out to others by their enslavers. Not including early European settlements across North America in what is now the United States, the very foundations of our national built environment was possible because of the labor of African, Afro-Creole, and African-American laborers. 
Former First Lady Michelle Obama drew the ire of many when she proclaimed at the Democratic National Convention in July 2016, quote, that is the story of this country, the story that has brought me to the stage tonight, the story of generations of people who felt the lash of bondage, the shame of servitude, the sting of segregation, but who kept on striving and hoping and doing what was needed to be done so that today I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves, end quote. It surprised me and I think much of the nation that many people did not understand or realize or want to realize just how much of our physical fabric and infrastructure was actually constructed by enslaved people. Since this quote, the White House Historical Association and numerous scholars have underscored this very fact. Construction on the President's House, as the White House was originally known, started in 1792 after architect James Hoban won the competition for the building's design, and we have here that design. Construction on the building ended in 1800. At that time, there wouldn't have been many of the famed individuals who we recognize as living in the White House in inhabiting that particular building. But we do know that the site's location between slave states Virginia and Maryland meant that the labor force was made up of enslaved people and free blacks, in addition to white laborers from the area, as well as immigrants from Ireland and Scotland. Planners initially intended to import European workers for the job, but quote, according to the White House Association, recruitment was dismal, end quote. So they turned to the enslaved who provided the bulk of the labor that was needed for not only the president's house, but also the US Capitol and other government buildings. The enslaved laborers who built the White House were both skilled and unskilled, engaging in work activities such as cutting down trees and sawing timber, digging foundations, digging clay for bricks, or working in any of the rock quarries that surrounded the area. So some of these individuals were also highly skilled in training and cutting and or cutting and carving stone. William O'Neill wrote in 1794, quote, keep the yearly hirelings at work from sunrise to sunset, particularly the Negroes, end quote. So this work was extremely instrumental to the construction of government buildings at that time. However, the vast majority of these individuals are unknown, but at least five of their names are known. Tom, Peter, Ben, and Harry were enslaved by White House architect James Hoban. A man named Daniel was enslaved by Hoban's assistant. Hoban earned $60 for each slave every year. Today, that amounts to about $1,900 per year for each person. In 2016, author Michael Daly estimated the total amount of owed in reparations for the labor of enslaved persons on the US Capitol and other government buildings to be over $83 million. Records indicate that only one enslaved man directly received compensation for his labor on the US Capitol. More importantly, wage rolls were kept not to identify or name these individuals, but to provide compensation for the enslavers for the rental of their property. These enslaved laborers contributed to the Capitol building and other government buildings, not only in the 1790s, but also after the White House or in the Capitol buildings were rebuilt in 1812. The irony of the presence of slavery and its effects in the capital city was highlighted by various groups in their anti-slavery and abolitionist campaigns. Visual propaganda of these groups like the broadside and other illustration here really shows how these groups intentionally situated federal buildings like the US Capitol as main characters in these stories about the enslavement of those of the African diaspora in the capital. Individuals were own, also hired out for their owners and involved in almost every stage of construction of the US Capitol building, which began in 1793. Approximately 385 payments were made to enslavers between 1795 and 1801 for what was listed in the records as, quote, Negro hire, end quote. So the federal government relied heavily on those enslaved persons. According to the architect of the Capitol website, to make it possible for Congress to move from Philadelphia to Washington in 1800. Congress unveiled a marker to acknowledge the work of enslaved people on Capitol buildings in 2012. This image from the Library of Congress below or here shows the Capitol dome that was as it was being erected in 1863. 
This was the year after the district's 3,000 enslaved persons were emancipated by the US Congress and President Lincoln. On top of the dome sits the statue in the inset at the upper left, the Statue of Freedom, an important statue of a 19 foot bronze woman holding a sword and laurel wreath. It was made by a man named Philip Reed who was enslaved by sculptor Clark Mills. Reed was paid $1.25 a day, which is about $40, to cast the statue. He was chosen because no one else had the skill to make the bronze statue out of the plaster cast made by Thomas Crawford, who had been commissioned to make the statue, but who was in France at the time. Interestingly, by the time the statue was set on the roof of the Capitol in 1863, Reed was a free man since the Emancipation Bill had been passed in 1862. Author S.D. Wyeth wrote in The Federal City in 1865, quote, Mr. Reed, the former slave, is now in business for himself and highly esteemed by all who know him, end quote. But while the names like Hoban and Mills figure largely in our history books, Philip Reed has only recently received attention. Many others, however, have not. As known and unnamed African-American craftsmen have been omitted from studies of early American architecture, even individuals with allied roles relevant to the uh, development of the American built environment are also overlooked. Here I have depicted Benjamin Banneker, and it, it amazes me when I ask my classes if they know who Benjamin Banneker is and they tell me no, it drives me bananas a little bit. Um, but Banneker was a free African-American almanac author, a surveyor, a naturalist, a farmer. He was born in Baltimore County to a free African-American woman and a man who had been formerly enslaved. Banneker had little formal education and was largely self-taught. He is known for being part of a group led by Major Andrew Ellicott, which surveyed the original borders of the District of Columbia. Banneker made the astronomical observations for which the survey starting point could be determined, so his contributions were absolutely instrumental. He also used his calculations to establish the boundary points for the district. So keeping in mind some of the allied contributions while not directly architects or craftsmen or builders that African-Americans had in the role of developing the built environment of this country. Another interesting figure depicted on the right is Anthony Allen. I didn't know that in the early part of the 19th century there were black people in Hawaii until I did research on this gentleman. So from 1810 to 1835, Anthony Allen, a man who had been formerly enslaved in upstate New York, owned several acres at the southeast corner of present day King and Punahou streets in Honolulu. At this site, Allen established a boarding house and a tavern, which he operated as an early resort of sorts. In addition to providing hospitality and recreational opportunities for Hawaiian monarchs and foreign settlers, Allen provided accommodations for visiting seamen of all races, even establishing a hospital for their care. He also engaged in traditional agricultural practices, traded with his neighbors, as well as newly arrived Protestant missionaries, and incorporated newer goods and services. One of the first known African-American settlers in the Hawaiian Islands, Allen's life and business practices are remarkable for the insight they provide not only about his land ownership, in real estate development, but also about early settlers of the African diaspora, race relations, and business practices of non-Anglo and non-European foreigners during the pre-contact and early missionary periods of Oahu's history. Also absent from textbook surveys on American architectural history are men such as Moses McKissick, Horace King, and Richard Allen. Moses McKissick was trafficked to this country from West Africa around 1790. Enslaved by a prominent contractor, William McKissick of North Carolina, who used him as a builder. Moses passed the trade down that he learned as a builder, primarily a bricklayer, down through the generations with his grandsons becoming the first licensed black architects in the Southeastern United States. Born into slavery in 1807, Horace King pictured at the center though enslaved, was taught to read and write at an early age. He had become a proficient carpenter and mechanic by his teenage years. He was introduced to bridge construction in the 1820s and went on to design some of the most important and largest bridges over waterways in Georgia, Alabama, and northeastern Mississippi. In 
His work also included prominent homes and civic buildings. Oops, not yet. <laughs> After King was um, emancipated by his then enslaver, um, John Goodwin, because John Goodwin essentially uh, freed him, manumitted him so that he wouldn't be taken as part of, he went bankrupt basically, and so that King wouldn't be taken as part of his property or seized by his creditors, King continued to work for Godwin's construction company. And when his former enslaver died in 1859, King assumed control of Godwin's businesses, prospering during and after the Civil War, and also passing down the family business and skill to his son, John Thomas King. Horace King was elected as a Republican to the Alabama House of Representatives, serving from 1870 to 1874. And then we have Richard Allen, pictured on the right, who was born enslaved in Richmond, Virginia in June, 1830. He was trafficked to Texas in 1837 and ultimately to Harris County, where he was enslaved by a man named J.J. Kane until his emancipation in 1865. Before freedom, Allen earned a reputation as a skilled carpenter and was credited with designing and building the mansion of Houston Mayor Joseph R. Morris. After emancipation, Allen became a contractor and was influential in civic government as well as being a bridge builder, a saloon owner, he built the first bridge over Buffalo Bayou in Houston, Texas. And while experimenting with his freedom, he also became an agent for the Freedmen's Bureau and a somewhat of a con confrontational or controversial registration supervisor in the 14th district in 1868. Such experience served as a catalyst for his interest, for Allen's interest in politics. He was also elected to the legislature, the Texas legislature in this case, and remained in civic engagement for the rest of his life, a trait that many African-American builders and craftsmen shared as they exhibited agency, not only as architects of the built environment, but also as architects of their communities. This kind of research and very specific study of individual builders is something that I've taken on and really focus my research and work in. And so my study of the Jean de Couleur Libre is unique with this methodology in that it offers specific study of individuals and their invo involvement with architecture based on the utiliz utilization of diverse primary source materials and documents. So as much as I've explored actual buildings that were erected or commissioned by Jean de Couleur Libre or Free People of Color in New Orleans, one of the goals of my research that was my dissertation and ultimately published as my first book was to explore the people behind the architecture of antebellum New Orleans. So I offered a fresh perspective on who they were as personalities, rather as just a series of characters, as well as a fresh perspective on not only their individual, but also their group agendas based on examining a variety of sources, some of which I've listed here. So combining archival documents from various repositories Op, um, archival materials that are readily available in most cases, but hadn't necessarily been analyzed in this very specific way to not only identify free people of color builders and craftsmen in antebellum New Orleans, but to consider their collective contributions to the city and their communities. New Orleans unique notary system in particular facilitates research into the architectural activities on New Orleans residents through um, building contracts and plans, property acts of sale. And while these tools were very useful in identifying and tracing property ownership of free people of color, uh, their, their motivations, uh, more like their you know, personal motivations, their financial motivations were more apparent in financial records, um, deed records, even for example, succession and probate records. In addition, documents like census records, city directories, and historic maps also offered a more personal look at individuals as well as a larger picture of life in antebellum New Orleans. And so on the one hand, the wealth of available primary source material really opened the door for wider comparison of the free people of color with one another, as well as with their contemporaries, both white and black in the city in the antebellum era. By the same token, the nature of the resource material also enabled me to narrow my work to the study of two particular families that really served as foils for one another 
but could serve as a nice comparison, but also offered a way to be able to look at other free people of color in the city of New Orleans during the antebellum era. And in particular, the years from 1820 to 1850 saw New Orleans become an important American metropolis and an industrialized shipping center. Those three decades provide a challenging as well as a fruitful framework in which to view the architecture-related accomplishments of New Orleans' Jean de Couleur Libre during a time in which New Orleans' stable economy, but also changing racial hierarchies, affected the success of free people of color in building, developing, and speculating. Their investments thrived in a city where racial separation was becoming increasingly strict, and they developed and helped to retain Black and Creole control in the city. The Jean de Couleur Libre were actors whose activities constituted property ownership and creation as they made New Orleans home and continued to make New Orleans home as they had done since the colonial period. So the two families that I studied in particular, the Dolioles and the Souliers, are among antebellum New Orleans families of color whose building, purchasing, and selling activities are really interwoven into the fabric of New Orleans architecture. Accordingly, they were frequently and clearly represented in primary source material, which also made it easier for them, me to study them as opposed to other families. However, a specific study of neither family had been undertaken, even though there were many sources that recognized the Dolioles as prolific builders and the Souliers as preeminent property owners. Brothers and natives of Provence, France, Louis Antoine and Jean-Francois Dolio immigrated to New Orleans sometime between 1763 and 1778 during the Spanish colonial period. The brothers established long-term extramarital relationships with women of color, becoming white patriarchs of mixed race families. Louis became involved with a free black woman named Geneviève Laurent. Louis' children, his three sons in particular, owned significant amounts of property in the Vieux Carré or the French Quarter and in Faubourg Tremé, which is a neighborhood just lakeside of the French Quarter once you cross Rampart Street. And they often improved those properties with buildings that they constructed, if not commissioned. Eulalie Mazange was a quadroon descended from a family of color established in New Orleans in the mid to late 1700s. And she was the long-term consort of Jean Soulier, who was a native of France and a member of the New Orleans militia. He had also held various positions in the city, such as city recorder as well. Eulalie and Jean had eight children who lived to adulthood, while the Soulier sons, Norbert, Albin, and Bernard, were influential builders, all of the children, including their sisters, Louise, Eulalie, Celeste, and Coralie, own and manage a significant amount of property in New Orleans. So by the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, and the events surrounding the Haitian Revolution began to impact the city, particularly with significant amounts of Creole immigrants into the city, both the Dolioles and the Souliers were already well-established. And so identification of the Dolioles and Souliers, as well as free other free people of color, um, really helped me to categorize their contributions into three areas that I considered overall in a process of being involved and active in the built environment. And ultimately, this almost tripartite process became the organization of my dissertation and the book as well. And so I considered their ownership of property, how they acquired it, where they own property, how they engaged with the landscape by transforming the property through um, cumulative property development, through the actual buildings that they constructed or commissioned in, um, in and around New Orleans, as well as entrepreneurship, how they undertook control of the built environment in very specific and intentional ways to really reinforce the financial strengths, not only of their themselves as individuals, but as family groups, but also within the free people of color community in New Orleans as well. And so this act of ownership and the legal possession of the built environment was really important concept and often the first step in this architecture driven identity building process by which many builders and developers of color established their place in antebellum New Orleans. And so most of the free people of color, including the Dolioles and Souliers, came into possession of property via two methods, 
by birthright or contract. Particularly the Dolioles were able to gain property via birthright by um, purchasing property for one another um, or together, as well as uh, circumventing a little bit laws in New Orleans because they couldn't directly inherit property from their white father. And so they went around that by having the father leave the property or funds to a third party who then essentially sold for pennies or gave the property to the Doliol children and to Genevieve Laurent. Because as a woman of color who was engaged in this relationship um, for many years, she could only inherit household goods, essentially furniture, silver, linen, and things of that nature. She couldn't inherit property. The Souliers, on the other hand, didn't necessarily acquire property from their father or their money. They basically established their own birthright through contract and purchasing property from um, and for other members of the New Orleans antebellum community, both white and black. And something that really struck me as I was doing this work was just the sheer amounts of property throughout New Orleans, not just in the French Quarter that you might consider, you know, just typical of the older colonial period, but also in the um, the newer Creole neighborhoods, both downriver and above the French Quarter, as well as in the more American sectors, which we know of today as the Garden District. Um, and here in this map, you can see via the dots um, in yellow, the properties that I encountered that were owned by the Dolioles at some time or another, and in red, properties that were owned by the Souliers. In some cases, they retained these properties. In some cases, they might have held them for just a matter of months before selling them to other free people of color or other New Orleanians in general. And particularly the Souliers were able to accumulate their wealth in this way. The Dolioles took advantage of that birthright by developing family enclaves in um, two different sections of the city, but both along St. Philip Street, one area, um, one block in the French Quarter and another block in Faubourg Cremay. Uh, and so we have their circumvention of the, the legal, um, the laws of this time period. And so here on the left, you're seeing several blocks or lots that they accumulated over time to develop basically this family enclave where they owned a significant amount of property in that block to develop a family enclave where they built houses for one another, established their mother's homestead here, a house for the sister and her husband were also constructed here. And then on the right, um, a little bit later, we have them basically doing the same thing once the Vieux Carré is filling up, more free people of color are moving to some of the other Creole, Faubourg or subdivisions like Treme, like Marigny in the city, and they're acquiring lots together and building houses for one another and other free people of color in the city. We also have members of both family really contributing to the Creole architecture of New Orleans, which is of course one of the city's most significant character defining features and was greatly influenced by the gens de couleur libre, including the Dolioles and the Souliers. And so in terms of their built works, the principal contribution of New Orleans gens de couleur libre was their ability to refine Creole forms like the Creole cottage in the city while to a certain extent expanding their use um, and interest in Anglo types, um, Greek revival detailing and so on and so forth. But for the most part, most native born free people of color were not interested in newer uh, styles like the shotgun house, for example, they really were focusing on those older forms. And this image is really displaying how especially the Dolios focused on the Creole cottage. They manipulated that overall form you know, when they were faced with narrower lots moving to other parts of the city uh, that were being developed. And so people were subdividing and, and selling narrower slices of property. Um, instead of building forms like the shotgun house, they were building basically narrower Creole cottages. Um, and we also have a couple of members of the Soulier family during the same thing. And so we have Jean-Louis Dolio and Joseph Dolio among free people of color who were really perfecting the Creole cottage form in the city, um, adapting it to these unique property situations. As I mentioned, uh, Bernard Soulier also contribute to that form. Um, on the other hand, Norbert Soulier is the only member of either family um, who really kind of went outside that mold in his experience and work. 
his repertoire primarily consisted of taller building forms, more Americanized building forms, higher levels of detail. And um, he also was involved in the one non-residential project uh, built by a member of either of the families, which was the Louisiana Sugar Refinery um, illustrated here at the bottom of this particular slide. Um, Norbert's output is particularly important and amazing um, is because he built these non-Creole and non-residential forms in a few short years before leaving New Orleans permanently in the early 1830s. So while the Dolioles and the Souliers had varying approaches to architectural form, they all worked more or less in vernacular styles and through varying means responded to the need for increased housing in a diverse and changing urban environment in antebellum New Orleans. As entrepreneurs, the Dolioles and Souliers organized and managed building and real estate activities with considerable initiative and risk. As a result, they were able to acquire substantial control of the built environment. The Dolioles and the Souliers were born free, had marketable skills as builders and developers, and gained reputations in the white Creole and Anglo communities via their familial associations and their clientele traits that allowed them to acquire wealth and financial security. Their privileges as free men affected their professional lives, allowing them to own real estate, enter into business contracts, lease and rent property, and trade on the open market. So by these means, men like the Dolioles and Souliers amassed significant amounts of wealth and really became pillars of their communities, exerting a measure of control that's not seen in other communities of color in the United States, whether we're talking about Richmond or Charleston, Savannah, other areas of the country. And this business of property ownership and building is very clearly spelled out in the Soulier family ledgers, several volumes of which survived and are in the collection of the historic New Orleans collection in New Orleans. Um, and so their income from these rental properties made them some of the wealthiest Jean de Couleur Libre as consistently illustrated in other documents like um, marriage contracts, even property values, um, credit ratings, estate files, as well as other archival material. The first census where the property values were recorded of the, these um, individuals was in 1850. And so at this date, Bernard's property holdings was valued at $20,000, a relative value of $594,000. And this was almost a decade ago. Um, I haven't updated that number. So a significant amount of money. Um, it also didn't include his, um, his wealth from his activities as a commissioned merchant. Many free people of color had diverse careers, basically, um, involved in real estate and development. Um, many were also tailors and, you know, hairdressers and other, um, earned other professions. And there was only one other free man of color in New Orleans who was wealthier than Bernard Soulier at that time period. And these family ledgers show that the Soulier's wealth and their diversification allowed them also to be money lenders, um, often financing others' real estate activities, which often, um, fostered further control of the built environment in New Orleans. And so here we're looking at two pages from that book, which is not only listing their money lending activity, the income that they're acquiring from rents for many of the properties that they're owned, what they're paying out to other builders and contractors for maintenance and repair work on those properties as well. And one of the buildings that was a rental property, um, several of the buildings are a stamp that I've pictured, um, illustrated one of them here in this particular slide. And so we also have the 1850 census showing that Jean-Louis Doliot owned a significant amount of, uh, had acquired a significant amount of wealth in the city. And while they weren't as wealthy as the Souliers, the Doliots also exerted a significant amount of control in the city. Um, particularly, they did this by the ways in which they amassed property collectively as a family, as we already saw in the two family enclaves on St. Philip Street, but also in concert with other free people of color. The Dolios, especially, um, they were longtime family friends with a man named Francois Bois de Ray. And here on the left, you can see properties that Bois de Ray um, and sort of highlighted or outlined in blue, and then properties that uh, Jean-Louis Doliot owned 
in red. And so they basically own together a significant chunk of this particular block. And that relationship between Dolio and Bois Doré really had significant impact is shown in the image on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, when the city of New Orleans sought to expand, expand Esplanade Avenue, they basically had to stop at the property of Bois Doré and Dolio, as you can see here at the very top of the slide, because they wouldn't sell them the property um, because they basically wanted what it was worth. They were like, no, you're not just gonna build us some sidewalks. We want the real value of our property. And basically that encouraged other property owners in the area to do the same thing. And so there was like a, basically a 10 year hiatus where ultimately the city of New Orleans had to pay Dolio and Bois Doré what they wanted so they could expand Esplanade Avenue. And so we see how even just owning property in close proximity to one another and working together fostered a certain type of agency for the Dolioles in particular. Uh, the only family members that I ultimately was able to obtain images of were the Souliers, uh, because serendipitously call it luck, whatever, um, a member of a uh, descendant, so Bernard Soulier's third great grandson uh, found my dissertation online and um, made contact with me. And we've been in contact since, and he was able to provide um, portraits of some of the family members, interestingly, and we're still not sure why there are no surviving images or photographs of any of the sisters. Um, but we have the brothers as well as Bernard Soulier and his wife, Eliza Corsell. And um, one thing that I realized after going back into some of the documents is that even though brother Norbert Soulier, who was sort of the more high level of the builders of the Souliers uh, left in 1830s, there was controversy surrounding that Louisiana sugar refinery um, project, which ultimately um, influenced his leaving the city. Um, they lived out the rest of their lives in Paris. Bernard Soulier was the last of the siblings to leave. He basically stayed in New Orleans to um, see to the, take care of the family's financial interests. Um, and, and his own as well. But he and Eliza Corsell had very specifically stated in their marriage contract that at some point they would be leaving New Orleans. Uh, and so it's almost like they kind of saw the writing on the wall of what might potentially happen in the city even as early as the 1830s. Uh, and so my research on the Dolioles and the Souliers and free people of color does continue in New Orleans. And in the same way, that a lot of these methods um, and this very specific examination of um, individuals and their contributions to architecture, um, I can you know, do very similar work in, for other free people of color or other families because there are just dozens and dozens of them who contributed to architecture in New Orleans in that way. Um, I've applied those methods also to additional work that I've done uh, more recently, especially surrounding Austin and Central Texas. And so um, I've concentrated a lot of my work on enslaved and freed men, builders and craftsmen in Austin. Um, here we have images of maps of plats of the city when it was founded in 1839. The 1840 census counted 850 people living in Austin, 145 of whom were enslaved. Um, many of the individuals who um, came to Austin at the very beginning were actually brought into the city as Edwin Waller, who was hired to survey basically the wilderness that was Austin or known as Waterloo at the time. Um, and so on his way to the site of Austin from Houston, he basically picked up um, enslaved persons that their enslavers hired out for the construction of this work. Um, and again, we don't know the names of most of those individuals, whereas we know the names of their enslavers, but we do have the names of three men, Mac, Adam, and Ned, who were responsible for contributions to the construction of what became the capital city of Texas. Um, as statehood came to Texas, the establishment of Austin as the permanent site of government, um, also we saw you know, various shifts in the contributions of enslaved African-Americans um, within the city of Austin, which was really just a small town. Um, as a result of permanent develop, uh, in 1852, the Texas state government authorized construction of a permanent state capitol building, which was pictured here. 
and we have a handful of amateur architects and other contractors who contributed to the project and their names are listed here. And among these men, um, most of them, except for two, were enslavers. And so the enslaved men of a certain age uh, working with these, with these architects and contractors would have been responsible for construction on buildings like the 1852 Texas State Capitol building. Among one of the most well-known of these individuals listed here is Abner Cook, who really was the preeminent builder in Austin in the 1850s, um, building or overseeing the construction of um, at least a dozen Greek revival homes, mansions really in the 1850s. Uh, one of those sites that I continue to research and work on is um, the main house, the main dwelling is pictured here at the lower right. This is the Washington and Mary Hill House, currently the Neil Cochran House Museum today in the city of Austin. And in recent years, we've come to understand and have um, embarked on a significant reinterpretation and restoration project on the outbuilding on that property that we understand would have been a slave quarters building. And as um, we really make people mad saying this, but it's really the only intact slave building in Austin. And by that, we mean it's intact in that it's recognizable as a slave structure um, or building that would have um, housed enslaved people. It's publicly accessible. It's no, you know, not in ruins. You can access the property and so on and so forth. So that's what we mean by that. Um, and it's been really amazing to research not just this building, but also a broader history of this site. Um, Abner Cook's, one of his peers who also worked on the Capitol building, the 1850s Capitol building, was a man named Thomas Jones. Um, in addition to the 1853 Capitol building um, and his own home, which is pictured on the left, Jones was the master builder or contractor of record for several other important buildings in 1850s Austin. Um, these included the Travis County, the first Travis County courthouse illustrated at the center and a commercial building um, called the Samson Henricks building. Uh, of these three, the only one that is not extant, no longer extant is the courthouse building. Of particular interest um, and really which kind of sparked uh, a deep dive into Thomas Jones and individuals that he might have enslaved and utilized their labor as part of his uh, business, his building business. Um, there was a, a man who we started calling the Negro Master Builder because of this article that Professor Ken Haferty at Baylor University shared with me. And so an unidentified contributor to this article in the Galveston Weekly Journal in 1852 is traveling to Austin from the East and he visits Jones's property and talks about um, this man. And so he says, quote, on the road to Austin up the west side of the Colorado, I crossed Burdett's Prairie dotted with highly cultivated plantations and elegant white country seats where I passed between immense fields of tall waving corn miles in extent. Here within three or four miles of Austin, Mr. Thomas H. Jones, a wealthy planter, and one of the contractors for the stone of the Capitol is erecting a stately mansion of a material which looks very much like the finest white marble. The master builder is one of his own Negroes who learned his trade at Nashville, Tennessee, end quote. So this was, I mean, it, there's a whole lot going on in this particular description. He's talking about Jones and the fact that he was a builder and there's some enslaved builder who was highly skilled and was trained elsewhere contributing to this. And so Dr. Hayfortief and I really began a journey to kind of figure out who this builder was. Um, thinking about the fact that there's no attribution, um, you know, these individuals enslaved or freedmen's names are usually not on cornerstones of buildings, um, but the Negro master builder uh, enslaved by Thomas Jones left a very interesting trademark or signature on his buildings. On one facade, of the Jones home is this um, arrangement of brick and it's laid or stone, limestone, and it's laid in a way, however, as if someone who was trained in brick masonry is wanting to lay the bricks. And after Dr. Hayfortief sent me this photograph, I said, wait a minute, I've seen this before. And I immediately went to a digital archive um, that has a bunch of history on Texas, the portal to Texas history, 
that has this photograph that I'd seen numerous times before and high up on the cornice of the Samson Henricks builder building of which Jones is the, the contractor or builder of record, you can see that very same pattern. And so it's, we, it's almost obvious, you know, that the same enslaved builder was working on these two structures. And then things got really, really interesting with Jones and the Negro master builder because of work that I was doing on a freedom community that was established in the late 1860s in Austin called Mason Town. And so there's extremely short entry in um, the handbook to Texas history, which is kind of like an encyclopedia, digital encyclopedia of Texas history that talks about Mason Town of most of the other freedom communities or colonies in Austin. Uh, there's, you know, just literally a like four, five, six sentence paragraph. It's very brief and not detailed at all. Uh, but we know that this neighborhood was founded by members of a, the Mason family, hence the name Mason Town, that they were brick masons and stone masons in the city, but then that's it. And I was like, well, why has no one done deed research to have more of a deep dive and, you know, um, significant history on this particular community? Well, so I started doing deed research, looking not only at Mason Town, which is the borders of that are depicted here in orange on this map, but I also encountered in some of my deed research, this area in yellow. Um, I didn't find the direct deed transaction where they acquired it, but when members of the Mason family sold two lots in this area, it mentioned that they had received it from a woman named Lily Jones. And I was like, that's kind of weird. And from my research already on Thomas Jones, I understood that Lily Jones was one of the daughters of Thomas Jones. So it was almost as something was saying, you know, there's a relationship here. And ultimately, I was able to solidify that relationship thanks to Ancestry.com. And one of my Ancestry um, hints with the little leaf popped up, um, the last will and testament of Thomas Jones's father was revealed to me um, via Ancestry. And in, in this, he's bequeathing property and individuals, enslaved individuals, to his children, among whom were Thomas Jones. And he very specifically states, I give and bequeath to my son, Thomas Jones, my Negro, Sam, Dicey, his wife, and a child named Isham. Um, this was our Sam Mason, who we know was the father of the gentleman who acquired the property in Mason Town. And so after a little bit more archival and historic research, um, I learned that the Jones family was established essentially in North Carolina, and as many people coming to Texas did, they moved through Tennessee where they lived for some time and then ultimately came to Texas in the, um, around 1845, 1846 in the early days of the Republic. And so uh, with this trajectory came Sam and Dicey and then the children that they had along the way. In the 1850 census, we see Sam and Dicey and their young sons unnamed, but accounted for um, is half of the 14 persons enslaved by the Jones family. And so Sam would have been extremely useful to Thomas Jones, who, as we've seen, was prolific in building in Austin in the 1850s as the contractor of record for these various important buildings in addition to his own home. And so Sam was our Negro master builder who was trained elsewhere, brought that skill to Texas and would have provided uncredited labor and expertise in these building projects we see the family of Sam and Dicey grow, um, starting to include grandchildren. And in 1860, they're among the 31 enslaved people um, that Jones recorded in this census. Um, and it's really interesting. And it just, you know, things click and make sense. After emancipation, Dicey took the name Jones, the surname of his, her enslaver, and Sam took the name Mason, his skill that he'd learned and practiced all these years. And so he's practicing you know, or forwarding not only the skill to his sons, but also this name. And so acknowledging that and really taking agency um, and ownership of that skill with this, with his name. And so here, after emancipation, on the right side of this map, the gray line in the middle is present day Interstate 35. Um, and so in the area known as East Austin, we have in red the boundaries of Mason Town, in orange properties 
that the Masons had acquired to basically become the foundation of Mason Town. In purple, the lots that they'd acquired from Lily Jones, as well as on the right in what is the downtown core now of the city, some of those buildings that Sam Mason had constructed um, in this image, just on different kinds of maps. So showing how different resources can offer the same, but different information on some of this information. Um, you know, and the, the Masons really took advantage of their freedoms to acquire property. We have them um, listed when they registered to vote in 1867 and so on and so forth. So really being able to understand their contributions in Austin in the post-bellum era as well has been quite rewarding. Um, the Masons, if you see the table here on the left, um, they're included in the 1870 census along now with many other individuals who were involved in the building trades as carpenters, blacksmiths, um, masons, and so on and so forth in the city. Um, on the left, I was able to sort of identify even some of the freedom colonies in Austin by understanding you know, that there are these clusters of African-Americans habitating here, um, and then others who lived in other areas of the city and even outside of the city limits. And so the masons would go on to continue to contribute to architecture in the city, particularly Sam's sons, um, three of whom were involved in the construction of the 1880s Texas State Capitol Building, which is our current state capitol building. Um, you know, they prospered in real estate development as we've seen, and this position that they had in the city, that experience would have made them likely candidates and contributors to the um, construction of that building. And these, cards basically are um, summaries, almost like an index of payroll records that are in the Texas State Library and Archives, listing not only the Masons, but also other contributors to um, the construction of that building who were on the payroll. So we see the Mason family here. And I'd like to think that they are also depicted in this image, um, as well as a couple of others that depict individuals who worked on the Texas State Capitol building this particular photograph was taken um, It includes builders and other dignitaries before this statue of the goddess of liberty was placed on top of the Texas State Capitol building. And I've zoomed in and sort of highlighted the African-American faces in that crowd. And so one day I hope to be able to positively identify members of the Mason family within these images. Um, another builder that I've had an interest in is Thomas Hill. Um, who, as this newspaper ad, which is, you know, very brief, but very unusual for the time period um, in the eight, mid early 1880s, um, it lists Thomas Hill, it, one of the Austin's most prosperous colored men, is building some kind of commercial building in, um, in Austin. And this was, um, again, in what is now the downtown core, just a few blocks from where he owned property and had his home. Uh, and Thomas Hill has been really uh, rewarding to study uh, after many occasions of, you know, Googling and, and looking up newspaper research, you know, things are always popping up new, which is one of the amazing things and, and fantastic things about doing research in a digital age. But I was pretty sure that I'd research or search for this man online using every single abbreviation or spelling of his name, but ultimately located an article where his entire last will and testament was published in the newspaper, just indicating how much influence and wealth he had in the city of Austin. So he's definitely an individual that I will be researching more, um, and especially since I was able to locate his tombstone in Austin's historic um, and first city cemetery. And if nothing else was obvious, um, in that last will and testament, he specifically stated, I want a nice tombstone that costs X amount of money, and so he got it. And it even includes, you know, symbols of his profession, of his expertise with some kind of stone or brick, a trowel and a plumb bob depicted here in the cemetery. And so this research um, has allowed me to, you know, really open the doors for identifying otherwise unknown and unidentified African-American builders and craftsmen in American history and architecture. Uh, it's contributed to, again, ongoing work that Dr. Rowena Houghton-Dash and I have done at um, the Neil Cochran House Museum. She is the director of that site. 
and thinking about how all of these connections in this history even offer a broader context about Austin's history. Um, and we've contributed that to um, an interpretive plan written by a certified interpretive planner for that particular site as we continue to carry this kind of research forward. And so we know that historically, the possession of the built world has informed the narratives that are passed on to posterity and with the challenges of identifying builders of color in the archival record and the deliberate erasure of individuals from the historic record, the memory of some of these builders and original owners has been lost. Identification and recognition of their authorship often sparks more questions than it gives answers. What were the circumstances of their training, the specifics of their professional practice, the relationship between black and white professionals and builders and their clientele? just how many additional unknown projects are out there that we can work to identify. And we can't answer some of these questions unless we're willing to take the kinds of resources that are right in front of us and in our faces, rethink questions of authorship, especially the authorship of individuals as non-traditionals contributors to the built environment, not as our professional or trained architects with a capital A, but other ways that um, people in marginalized groups have contributed to the American built environment, not only for enslaved builders, but for African American builders, builders of other marginalized groups and communities. We have to know where to look, how to look, and be willing to look in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody for coming both in person and on Zoom. Uh, we are now gonna do questions both in the room and on Zoom. And so uh, I think what I'm gonna do is monitor questions in the room and uh, have Dr. Dudley repeat them so that people can hear them clearly. Uh, and we're also monitoring the Zoom chat in the front. So if you have a question, please go ahead and stick it in the Zoom chat and we will try to get it answered too. So I'm gonna turn this back over to her. Wonderful. Uh, first, I'd like to, just because it'll be a little bit easier, address any questions that we might have in the room. And I'll also open up the chat here. And again, thanks to everyone online for hanging out and coming today. And so the question is about uh, Sam Mason and his being trained in Nashville. And if I'd done any research yet to find that brick pattern in any other buildings that might be in Nashville or Tennessee. Um, that pattern is very typical of brick construction in the manner in which you do a Flemish bond pattern in brick. Um, and more than anything, it just really hones in on the fact that, it, you know, taking what are fairly large, in some cases, pieces of limestone that had been quarried locally in Texas, that instead of just, you know, laying them in a regular pattern in masonry, which is typical you know, that he's doing this and laying that that way. And it could be, again, perhaps because he was trained as a brick mason and now is working in limestone, although there were also limestone buildings, particularly in the area where um, the Jones family and their, um, their peers lived as well. Uh, it also could be because of the size stones that were available. And so he's, you know, we don't have just large stones and we have these different size stones so I'll manipulate that this way. But either way, it just shows his hand in the work and a specific, you know, like the intent of the actual builder. <laughs> so we have a question on the real estate in New Orleans that the free people of color had and if rental properties were residential or commercial. Most of the properties that I encountered from the Dolios and the Souliers were residential rentals. Um, however, there were some properties that had mixed use, um, perhaps stores on a ground level, especially the townhouse kind of buildings might have had multiple families residing in those buildings, some kind of business or commercial enterprise on the lower floor. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, and so the question is, do the free people of color, particularly families like the Soulier, see rental properties just as business ventures? or is helping with community uplift. And it's absolutely both um, because the Souliers, you know, they're amassing wealth in this way um, and consistent wealth, especially for the Soulier sisters, none of whom married. And so they were able to maintain a level of independence 
um, and not have to solely rely on their brothers. Their father was um, deceased uh, by the time that they're really into um, real estate development at this time. And so they basically were able to be, you know, independent on their own without being married, which would have been, you know, typical of that time period. But also this is definitely community uplift as the Jean de Couleur Libre are helping one another. Um, there might be a, a woman of color who is, um, you know, taking in um, tenants for her own, you know, needs, but also helping other people in her community, um, selling property to other free people of color that really is just helping the whole Jean de Couleur Libre community retain control of, you know, these areas of the city that were historically Creole, that were welcoming to free people of color, as you have all this change that's happening in New Orleans, especially in this time period, more Americans coming in, we have European immigration happening, um, immigration as a result of the Haitian revolution. And so it really is just all around helping to sustain, um, like I said, not only the free people of color community, but even just the French Creole community as well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, the question is if I've seen a connection or expansion of the Creole cottage form in other places, especially in Texas. And one of the things that I've been increasingly doing to kind of expand this, I mean, really what is a Caribbean world of New Orleans and even to Texas, because you have free people of color at various points in the antebellum era. And then especially as we get, you know, things not being more fluid as they were, but just strictly black and white who are immigrating even to Mexico, going to Texas. And so the research that I'm starting to embark on now is to look at free people of color communities, especially people who are coming from New Orleans or other parts of Louisiana as they're moving into and through Texas as well. Okay, so in the New Orleans Creole buildings, have you been able to um, able to determine whether form, plan, or detail may be said to derive from various origins from their developers? Um, yes, so there is, um, there, and I do focus on typology in my work and in the book, but there have been many other um, architectural historians, anthropologists who really were um, already focused on the typology of Creole forms of architecture from which influences they derive. Um, and so you have more or less an agreement of, you know, what the, the West African influences are um, French and Spanish influences, but ultimately they, it just illustrates exactly what Creole means. It's a mixture. And sometimes you can't directly pinpoint and it's more or less, you know, like that, that just that Caribbean sensibility and that change that happens from these places of origins, um, even in parts of France. And then you throw in uh, the French influence coming in from folks like the, um, the Acadians when they're expelled um, by the British from Canada and then settling in Louisiana because there's already a significant French community there. So it made sense for them to go there. Um, and so overall, just this, you know, significant Creole dynamic that is important. And um, I, I do talk about those influences, but there are others that do so, so much better um, than I do in, in thinking about typology and form. Okay, the next question is from our friend Roz, who hey, Roz. says, um, Black surveyors in Austin no longer exist. Is there any body of research that you've come across that offers a specific look at the work of Black surveyors, either enslaved or free? No, I have not encountered many historical figures involved in survey work. Um, I think the biggest figure would probably be Benjamin Banneker as I talked about, um, not to say that individuals didn't have those skills, but in tandem with other skills, because a lot of these people would have been basically jacks of all trades and they could do a lot of specific work. And you see more of that specific, um, you know, the shift between building and contracting and architecture design, professionally trained and educated um, folks, um, also more specific focus on um, distinct crafts like blacksmithing, plastering, carpentry work, um, masonry work. Um, you know, some of these folks who are listed in older city directories and census records, just as a laborer, might be working on building sites as surveyors of some sort. 
So unfortunately, we really don't know, but I know that's something you're interested in, Ms. Roz, and so I'll definitely keep that in mind for future research. Okay, one more question from the Zoom. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation. For the Black developers and landholders in Austin, were you able to determine whether those properties were inherited from within those families or became casualties of eminent domain, highway construction, et cetera? Uh, there's a good combination of that. And I think as a result, especially of the 1928 city plan, which was a plan where the city of Austin hired developers from Dallas to um, basically create a plan that would legalize segregation um, you know, in the city and relegated African-Americans who had lived throughout Austin historically and even at that time to what is now East Austin um, and referred to in a lot of cases as Black East Austin on the east side of Interstate 35 where Mason Town um, and most of the Mason family properties were located. Um, but there were communities that retained a straight, stronghold. Um, Clarksville was one of those freedom colonies uh, where many African-Americans lived for many years. Um, there are certain aspects of that community where the heritage has been retained, the architecture, the historic um, African-American church, Sweet Home Baptist Church is still there. And although the families don't live there anymore, they still come back to worship at that particular institution. Um, I learned through my research that even in communities like Wheatville, which um, very quickly lost its, um, its boundaries, so to speak, the historic fabric in that community, that there were families living in Wheatville, African-American families, even in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and, and that community is just at the west edge of the University of Texas campus. And so was facing, even from the 1880s and 1890s, the growth of that institution. Um, there are properties that have been retained by families, but increasingly you see less and less of that as um, individuals are growing older, they either don't have descendants or their descendants have moved away and are no longer interested in retaining those properties. Austin has seen a ridiculous amount of growth in the um, just over 20 years that I've been there. And so for many people, it's just no longer financially viable um, to live in Austin with um, the increase in land values and property taxes as well. So there's a lot in play um, as to why um, properties and that have been historically African-American in the city are or are not um, retained at the, in the present time. Okay, we have another Zoom question. Uh, Dr. Dudley, thank you so much for this insightful talk. I wanted to compliment you on your work in your book, Building Antebellum New Orleans. Seeing that you focused on both these two families, how are you able to balance highlighting the uniqueness of both of these families' histories and their contributions while also simultaneously discussing how they contribute to your larger study? Great. That's a great question too. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I picked the Dolioles and the Souliers was one, there was a lot of secondary source material that was already talking about those families. There just had not been a deep dive into their work. Um, and just the, the work that I did offered, you know, that very broad contextual view and opportunity to develop a method where other free people of color might be able to be researched and their contributions analyzed. Um, the Dolios, you know, they're also the same in that both families had their origins in the Spanish colonial period, but the Dolios um, have descendants who are still in the city. The Suliers do not. Um, and so it was, it was just, you know, really focusing on those, um, those that agency and the, the ownership of their entrepreneurship and their engagement and how the Dolios and Suliers were doing that in ways that were the same and in ways that they were different by analyzing those primary source materials. Um, and again, it's that kind of analysis that could be applied to other people. And I already have like articles and other books in my head, but it would be really cool and not in maybe such an in deep, you know, in-depth dive. And so this is for all you other historians and architectural historians and people who were interested, you know, some kind of series on free people of color um, in particular, they kind of, you know, essentially established a context and, you know, to take that, we don't have to reestablish the context, but to take some of those documents and look at other families in the same way to help expand our um, architectural history and history canon of not just New Orleans, but people who are contributing to architecture and design 
in ways that are non-traditional. So the question is regarding the diversification of free people of color and if it's common or if it is, um, you know, by virtue of them being in New Orleans um, in that particular place and time. Um, you know, and I've seen, it's kind of yes to both parts of the question um, because I've seen similar diversification in free people of color in other communities. You know, like your day job is a milliner or whatever it is but then you're also engaged in real estate and property development and speculation. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Dudley. I was really interested in your method of research for finding both Sam Mason and Dicey Jones in the context of indigenous peoples. How might you recommend researching their role in the built environment? That is a really good question. And I do not have the answer to that question. Um, just because, again, uh, some of the archival material is a little bit different or unavailable. And actually for personal and other reasons, I'm very interested in doing research on native peoples. Um, and especially in a place like Louisiana, where you have so many people, or even Texas, so many people coming through um, and, and affecting the built environment. You have the merging of peoples and groups, um, and especially with indigenous groups in the face of Anglo settlement who are either you know, moving out willingly or being sent elsewhere um, or merging uh, tribes and peoples. Um, it, it's really hard. And I have not um, personally engaged in a whole lot of research in that area, but I'm definitely interested, uh, especially because of the relationships and again, the contributions of those groups that um, that are obviously there and just have not been explored um, similarly to the works of um, other marginalized groups. Okay, I think Thank we're you. gonna end that there. Thanks everyone yes. on Zoom. Good evening. Brilliant.